Hi, and congratulations on finishing all the courses in this specialization. Now, the only thing that stands between you and the certificate is me. Actually, it's not me, it's the capstone that I will present today. I want to explain that there are some differences between the courses you took before and this capstone. In the courses you took before, we presented you with perfectly formulated, clear algorithmic problems. We define the range of possible parameters and we specify the algorithms that you need to solve these problems. In the capstone, the things will be different. The problems will be loosely defined and you will need to transform them into exact algorithmic problems. It will not be immediately clear what is the range of the parameters and will give you only the hints rather than the details of the algorithms that you need. However, you are now algorithmic pros and I am confident you will be able to solve all the challenges in this capstone. One of the biggest news in 2011 was European E. coli outbreak. It started as food poisoning with bloody diarrhea that often followed by kidney failure and death. The outbreak quickly spread from Germany to many European countries and in the beginning it was unclear what was the cause of the outbreak. The usual suspects in the case of outbreaks are different vegetables. But to which vegetables? Cucumbers? Carrots? There are a lot of choices. In the beginning of the outbreak, German officials identify cucumbers as a likely source of infection and thousands of tons of cucumbers and other vegetables were destroyed all over the Europe. Four years later, it turned out that German officials were wrong and they were ordered to pay compensation to Spanish farmers who lost billions from destroyed cucumbers. In 2011, German health officials identify a restaurant in Lübeck where 20% of all visitors developed bloody diarrhea. After interviewing patrons of this restaurant who developed bloody diarrhea, they figure out that almost all of them ate bean sprout. The owner of this restaurant was outraged and publicly offered to eat all sprouts in his restaurant, but it turned out that the cause of the outbreak was actually a huge lot of uh, bean sprouts that was sent from Egypt to Europe and was now a time bomb sitting in hundreds of stores and restaurants all over the continent. In May 2011, a girl from Hamburg developed bloody diarrhea after eating sprouts and doctors suspected that it was a common pathogenic E. coli strain. But the blood sample from this girl did not pass the test for known E. coli strain. At this point, it became clear that a new pathogen has emerged and the goal was to sequence the genome of this pathogen and to figure out how it has become pathogenic. And our goal in this capstone will be to figure out what is the genome of this mysterious E. coli X uh, from the girl admitted to a hospital room in Hamburg. To answer this question, you have to develop your own assembler and apply it for assembling grids obtained from a girl from Hamburg uh, who developed bloody diarrhea. Developing genome assemblers is not for faint-hearted. To learn more about how it is done, you may attend our bioinformatics specialization on Coursera or read the book Bioinformatics Algorithms, an active learning approach. Assembling E. coli X bacterium is a rather complex algorithmic challenge. And to make it easier for you, we broke it into three simpler challenges. We start from assembling Phi X174 virus, which is a small, uh, a little over 5,000 nucleotide virus with just 11 genes. Afterwards, 
we will assemble the smallest bacterial genome known called N. deltocephaline coli, which is just 110,000 nucleotides and approximately 140 genes. And finally, we will assemble 50 times larger E. coli X bacteria, which has roughly 5 million nucleotides and approximately 5,000 genes. Our first task will be to assemble a small phi X174 phage. Phages are bacterial viruses and they cannot replicate on their own and must infect bacteria to do so. And phage X174 is almost like a cult organism in genomics because it was the first sequence genome completed by Nobel Prize winner Franz Sanger in 1977. You will follow in the footstep of Franz Sanger to assemble the phi X174 genome. Our next task will be to assemble the smallest bacterial genome. This bacteria lives inside leaf hoppers and its sheltered life allowed it to reduce its genome to only about 110,000 nucleotides, 50 times smaller than E. coli X genome and only approximately 140 genes. It lacks some genes necessary for survival, but products of these genes are supplied by its bacterial hosts. And biologists believe that this bacterial genome is losing its bacterial identity and turning into a part of the insect genomes, just like mitochondrion in uh, human cells. And your goal will be to follow in the footsteps of biologists who sequence this genome in 2013. And finally, after you sequence the phage and the smallest bacterial genomes, you will assemble E. coli X. You will start from assembling a phage genomes, and we will give you thousand simulated, error-free reads randomly sampled from the phage genome. And I want to tell you that this phi X174 genome is a circular genome. Each read will be 100 nucleotides long. To add suspense, all genomes in this capstone will contain a tag, a 10 nucleotide long insertion that we added to the genome to make your life a little bit more difficult. And your goal will be to figure out the sequence of the tag. You are now facing the genome sequencing problem, which is to reconstruct a genome from reads. Input to the genome is a collection of strings reads, and output a string genome reconstructed from reads. Is the problem clear? This is the first example of the problem in this specialization that has not been well formulated. This is actually not a computational problem because I have not described precisely what does it mean to assemble a genome from reads. In fact, it will be your task to figure out how to formulate algorithmic statement for this biological problem of what does it mean to assemble a genome. You will need to formulate a rigorous algorithmic problem that adequately models genome assembly. And it will be more like in real life, because in real life you won't be presented with perfect algorithmic formulations. You will be presented with real life problems, and your goal will be first to transform these real life problems into a computational problem, and later on to solve the problem using the uh, algorithms that you learned in this course. And your programming challenge will be, after you formulated this problem, your programming challenge will be to assemble the mutated phage genome from simulated error-free reads and find out the inserted tag. After you assemble the phage genome from error-free reads, your more complex task will be to assemble the same genome from error-prone reads. And in this case, each read will have errors only substitutions of nucleotide, no insertion and deletions, with this probability 1% at each position. This is actually similar to the errors 
in real sequencing grids. And first, you have to formulate this question, which means formulate a rigorous algorithmic problem that adequately model genome assembly from error-prone reads. And finally, solve the programming challenge assembling mutated phage genome from simulated error-prone reads and, of course, finding the inserted tag. In fact, this programming challenge is very similar to the challenge that Fred Sanker, the inventor of modern DNA sequencing, faced 30 years ago when he assembled the same phage genome. However, at that time, sequencing was very expensive. And extending the, his sequencing method to human genome at that time would cost hundreds of billions of dollars and would be impractical. And that's why many scientists tried to find out what would be a better experimental technology to sequence genome. And that's how they came up with an idea of gene chip that we will discuss in the next section. We will now talk about one of the alternative technologies for DNA sequencing called DNA chips or DNA arrays. When Sanger assembled the phage genome from 500 nucleotide long grids in 1977, scaling this to the human genome would be extremely expensive and would likely fail due to unresolved algorithmic challenges. Nevertheless, U.S. government in 1984 started to plan the Human Genome Project that another 16 years later, in, 19, uh, in 2000, resulted in the draft sequence of the human genome. But at the same time, Three scientists in three different countries thought about an alternative technology for DNA sequencing, and they invented so-called DNA chips. Here's the main difference between DNA chips, or DNA arrays technology, and Sanger sequencing. In Sanger technology, biologists generate some, but not all, long grids sample from the genome. And read lens is approximately 500 nucleotides. That was the read lens that Sanger used. In the DNA chip technology, biologists generate all short chemers from a genome. But K is much smaller in this case. Instead of 500, it may be in the, in the original DNA chips paper, it was proposed that K equal to 10. Ideally, a DNA chip would generate a KMER composition of a string, a multiset of KMERs that are present in the string, like shown here. Please note that some KMERs in this multiset appear multiplied times. For example, ATG appears three times. Our goal is to reconstruct the original string from this KMER composition. And please note that also I ordered this uh, three mer in the order they appear in the string. In reality, I don't know the order. Let's try, nevertheless, to assemble this three mer into the string, and we will represent every three mer as a vertex in the graph, and this is a path in the graph that corresponds to the string. Uh, and the question I want to pose is. Can you construct this genome pass, or pass that spells the genome, without knowing the genome, only from its composition? Well, if we simply connect two chemers, if suffix of the first chemer is equal to the prefix of the second chemer, then we will get this pass. For example, we connect TAA with AAT, because TAA ends in AA, and AAT starts in AA. However, if uh, we introduce all edges based on these principles, then of course we will construct this genome path. But in addition, we will also have to connect some other vertices with each other. In fact, many vertices, and many more. And as a result, we will get 
a graph like this. Where is the genome path? Well, it is the, still the same horizontal path, but remember the reality is that the order of these three maps in the genome is unknown, and therefore if we order them lexicographically, this is the graph that we get. Where is the correct path in this graph? Let's try to reconstruct this uh, string. I will even give you a hint. Let's say this string starts with TA. Then we look at the vertex TA and we find a vertex that is connected with TA by an edge. In this case, it will be AT. Then we'll continue and continue and continue and continue like this. What are we trying to do? So we are trying to extend the path, but what is the problem that we are trying to solve uh, while doing this? And please note that from every vertex I visit, there are often multiplied choices of the next vertex. Well, if we continue further, then you will see that the problem we are trying to solve is finding a Hamiltonian pass in this graph, or a pass that visits each vertex exactly once. We will now discuss a problem of assembling a genome from its K-mer composition. This is a puzzle with just 16 pieces. However, it is very complex, harder than you think. It may set you back for many hours because it is a highly repetitive puzzle. Every frog in this puzzle is repeated multiple times. When you try to assemble the phage genome from its k there is a similar complication because if k is small, some cameras will be repeated, as an example we saw before. As, as a result, there may be multiple solutions of the problems that complicate our task. And the exercise break that I recommend you to think about is to answer the following question. What is the minimum value of k for which the phage genome can be uniquely reconstructed from its k composition? This is another example of a rather complex puzzle with repeated pieces. In fact, there was a $2 million prize announced for this puzzle, for solution of this puzzle, but the puzzle remains unsolved till this day. Please note that what you see at this slide is actually not a solution because there are seven empty pieces that nobody was able to place yet. And uh, it is called Eternity 2 Puzzle. We do not ask you to solve the Eternity 2 Puzzle. It's extremely complex. But we ask you to solve a simpler puzzle assembly problem when you have to assemble a smaller version of this puzzle that requires placing 25 square pieces into a 5x5 five five grid, as opposed to the Eternity Puzzle when you have to face uh, 256 pieces into 16 by 16. Great. 70 years ago, a Dutch mathematician, Nicolas de Bruyne, thought about solving a different puzzle, finding a string containing each binary k exactly once. He called these strings universal strings. For example, these are all eight binary 3 mers and we can construct the graph, overlap graph, for these eight simmers and find a Hamiltonian path in this graph. In this case, it will be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. But De Bruyne wanted to solve this problem for any k, and you can imagine that for k equal, let's say, to 20, the overlap graph will contain million of vertices, and it will be very difficult to figure out whether there is a Hamiltonian pass in this graph. And that's why de Bruyne wanted to implement a different idea based on construction of a different graph. He wanted to construct a graph in which every camera correspond 
to an edge rather than a vertex, and where each k universal string corresponds to an Eulerian path or a path that visits every edge exactly once, rather than Hamiltonian path that visits every vertex exactly once. And we will now face the Eulerian path problem, construct an Eulerian path in a directed graph where input is a directed graph and output is a path visiting every edge exactly once. And now you may be puzzled or even confused. Why in the world we would want to change one problem, Hamiltonian path problem, into another problem, already in path problem, that looks almost identical to the Hamiltonian path problem? You will learn why in the next section. I will now describe De Bruyne graphs that De Bruyne invented for solving the universal string problem. Recall that before we were labeling vertices by k mers and we were looking for a Hamiltonian path in the resulting graph. Now we will label edges by k mers as shown here, but how would we label vertices of this graph? Well, we will label, uh, given an edge, labeled by a streamer, we will label its initial vertex by a prefix of this streamer and its final vertex by a suffix of this streamer. For example, if we have a streamer TAA, initial vertex will be labeled by TA and final vertex will be labeled by AA. As a result, we will have the following labeling. Three mers uh, represent edges and two mers represent vertices. And after De Bruyne constructed a pass labeled in this way, he started to do something strange, even counterintuitive. So given this pass, let's glue together identically labeled vertices in this pass. For example, there are uh, multiply vertices labeled AT. Let's start gluing them together here, here, and we glue them in a single vertex. Our path has been transformed into a graph, but that's not it. We also have TJ, TJ repeated vertices, glue them together like this. Continue further with these vertices, glue them together, and this is something that is called the De Bruyne graph of the string. The interesting thing is we actually don't need to know the string to construct the De Bruyne graph. We can construct it from its three mers only. Indeed, De Bruyne graph of the set of k mers pattern is constructed in the following way. Vertices of the graph are all unique k minus one mers occurring as a prefix or suffix of k mers in the set patterns, and edges in this graph represent each k mer in patterns. It corresponds to a directed edge that connects its prefix vertex to its suffix vertex. And the next problem you will have to solve is constructing the De Bruyne graph from a set of k mers. Input a set of k mers pattern, output a graph De Bruyne of patterns. Remember, we started from a genomic pass that spells the genome and ended up with this transformation of this genomic pass into the De Bruyne graph. But where is the genome hiding in this graph? Well, it was there in the beginning. We were just gluing some vertices, so it must be in the De Bruyne graph somewhere, and here it is. So if we follow the edges, of the graph, what, by the way, what are we trying to do when we go through the edges? We are trying to find an Eulerian path that visits each edge exactly once. And in the next segment, you will learn why I prefer to solve Eulerian path problem over the Hamiltonian path problem. We will now make an abrupt turn from the universal string and talk about another classical problem 
in combinatoric calls bridges of Königsberg. Citizen of Königsberg, and this is a 300 uh, years old map of Königsberg, we're interested in the following problem. Königsberg consisted of four sectors shown by uh, colored uh, circles here, and these sectors were connected together by seven bridges. So citizens of Königsberg asked the following question, can I live from my home, walk through each bridge exactly once, and return back to my home? And this puzzle is now known as the bridges of Königsberg problem. And this uh, uh, puzzle, of course, can be transformed into a graph theoretical problems if we connect all of four nodes representing uh, four sectors of the city by edges. Every edge corresponds to a single bridge in this city. So if bridge connects sector A with sector B, then we will connect node A with node B in the corresponding graph. To solve the bridges of Königsberg problem, what problem do we need to solve in this graph? And of course, you realize that we will need to solve the already pass problem in this graph, or a pass visiting every edge in the graph exactly once. And this is the problem that was solved 300 years ago by a great mathematician, Leonard Euler. If you look at two problems, already in cycle problem, and Hamiltonian cycle problem, and we will be, instead of talking about passes, we would prefer to talk about cycles, simply because bacterial genome are usually cyclic genome, circular genome, and they are interested in bacterial genome. Can you find a difference between these two problems? The only difference is that Eulerian cycle problem talks about visiting every edge, while Hamiltonian cycle problem talks about visiting every vertex. So why did we introduce the Eulerian cycle problem instead of Hamiltonian cycle problem if they are so similar? It will become clear in a second. Let's return back to the universal strain problem, but let's now talk about universal circular strain problem because once again we are interested in circular bacterial genome. And this problem is to find a circular string containing each binary k-mer exactly once. For example, for three mers, for these three mers, this is a universal circular string containing them. For example, 101 is encoded here on this circle. We already saw how to solve the universal string problem using the overlap graph. But de Bruyne was not satisfied with this approach, and his, his idea was to construct the de Bruyne graph of the same string, and that is how the de Bruyne graph of this eight string looks like. And if we want to construct a universal circular string, we simply need to take an Eulerian cycle in this graph that we are building right now by visiting all edges of this graph. We succeeded building the de Bruyne graph for all three mer, and this is a more complex de Bruyne graph for four universal strings. Does it have an Eulerian cycle? How would we answer this question, particularly if we are interested in a de Bruyne graph for 20 universal strings with these over a million vertices. To answer the question I asked in the previous section, we will have to prove Euler's theorem. Uh, remember we asked the question about whether there is an Eulerian cycle in this graph. And I will first ask, is the graph for four universal strings balanced? And by balanced graph, I mean the in degree of every vertex is equal to the out degree of uh, every vertex. And you can check that this specific graph is balanced. And of course, every Eulerian graph 
is balance. Because if you can find a walk visiting every edge exactly once, and this walk enters in a given vertex, let's say k times, then it has to leave the same vertex the same number of times, which means that the number of incoming edges in every vertex is equal to the number of outgoing edges from every vertex. So this is very simple. What is less trivial is, as earlier proof, every balance graph is already in, which means as soon as we prove that the graph is balanced, there must be an already in cycle in the corresponding graph. To prove Euler theorem, we will need to recruit an ant and let it randomly walk through the graph. Of course, the ant cannot use the same edge twice because we want the ant to generate an Eulerian cycle in the graph. If ant was a genius, he would simply start from an arbitrary vertex in the graph and start walking along the graph, and chances are that by the end, the end would generate already in cycle right here, and and can go home because we have an already in cycle. But a less intelligent end would start walking and may get stuck at some vertex. But in what vertex an end can start? You have to prove that the only vertex the end can start is the vertex where the end started, which means this red vertex. What should we do next? Because we have not visited all edges of the graph yet. So the end has completed the cycle, but it's not oil radian. Can we somehow enlarge this green constructed cycle? Well, please note that maybe we should start at a different vertex of this green cycle. Which one? Probably the vertex where there are still some unexplored edges of the graph. So let's try to start in this vertex. And we have chosen this one because there are edges that have not been traversed by the end. We will have to give the end different instruction. The ant now doesn't just start walking randomly in the graph because it may end up in the same uh, incomplete cycle. Instead, we first ask the ant to traverse the same green cycle starting from the new vertex. So it will go here, 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 and then return back to the red vertex. However, the ant's walk is not over yet because now he can continue. And he continues working, walking, walking, and finally returns back to the same red vertex. So we successfully enlarge our green cycle and is now green-blue cycle. What do we do next? We are stuck again. But let's repeat the same procedure. Let's find a node where there are still unexplored edges. Here is a vertex with still unexplored edges. And let's once again force our end to traverse previously constructed green-blue cycle. So let's go, continue, 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 continue. We return back to the red vertex but now there is a possibility to walk further. We continue enlarging the green-blue cycle, continue, continue, and finally the ant proved Euler area. It constructed the Eulerian cycle. And this is an example of constructive proof when the proof of the theorem immediately implies an algorithm for constructing Eulerian cycle. However, I have to warn you, this is not the most efficient algorithm for constructing Kohlerian cycle, and we will ask you to construct a linear time algorithm for uh, building on a Kohlerian cycle in the graph. And after implementing the linear time algorithm for constructing Kohlerian cycle, you will be able to solve the universal string problem for any reasonable k, even let's say for k equal 20. The only question left 
is that in this graph there are actually many universal strings. And that's fine because any universal string would solve the universal string problem. But in genome assembly, there are also often many possible Lorentzian cycles, but only one of them corresponds to real genome. And in the next segment, we will learn what biologists do to uh, sequence the genomes today and to address this challenge. In fact, many genomes assembled today, thousands of genomes each year, are not assembled into a single circular string, as in the case of bacterial genome, but instead are split into multiply countries. Let me explain why it is happening. We previously described how to move from reads to De Bruyne graph of genome and finally to genome as a path, uh, Eulerian path in this graph. But in reality, even in this simple graph, there are multiply Eulerian passes. For example, here's one Eulerian pass and here's another Eulerian pass. Which of these multiply Eulerian passes corresponds to a real genome? And often biologists don't have a possibility with modern sequencing technologies to answer this question, at least to answer it on limited budget. And that's why they break genome into context. They note that these non-branching passes in this graph correspond segments of each possible Aurelian pass. And as a result, they break the brain graph into the following context corresponding to the following string, and this is often output as the solution of genome sequencing problem. It is an imperfect solution, but that's what we want you to do, to output context that belong to all possible Eulerian passes in the constructed De Bruyne graph. And context generation problem will be given a set of KMR patterns, generate all contexts in the graph De Bruyne of patterns. In the previous section of this presentation, we gave you a somewhat idealized view of genome assembly. Now let's go to a more realistic description of how biologists sequence the genome. The reality is that these days they don't generate individual reads, they generate pairs of reads. To achieve this goal, they randomly cut genome into large, equally, roughly equally sized fragments of size in short lengths. And then afterwards they read just the prefix and suffix of each such segment, for example, the modern, most popular Illumina technology today reads 250 nucleotides from the beginning and 250 nucleotides from the end of such segment. But the additional piece of information you get from this re uh, experiment is that these two reads within a read pair are separated by a certain lens, which is called insert lens. So, an important update on modern sequencing technology is that instead of generating individual reads, biologists generate read pairs. And our goal is to take advantage of additional information that read pairs uh, generate, which is the distance between them. In other words, if we have a genome, and I showed you read 1, which is TCA, shown in red, and read 2, which is TCC, shown in blue. In addition to these reads, we also know the distance between this read. And a paired camera is a pair of camera at a fixed distance d apart in the genome. For example, TCA, the red one, and TCC, the blue segment, are at distance d equal 11 apart. Disclaimer, biologists actually cannot measure the exact distance. They only measure approximate distance. But 
for start, we will assume that the distance is exact. To model generation of paired reads, we will consider paired composition of a string instead of composition that we considered before. And paired composition of the string will consist, let's say, from a paired streamer, TAA, then unknown nucleotide, and then GCC here. And the paired composition will represent all such paired streamers as shown here. And the problem we will be facing is string reconstruction from read pairs. Input a set of paired camera and output a string text such that paired composition of text coincide with the set of paired cameras. And of course, we assume that the distance between paired cameras within a read pair is known. How would De Bruyne assemble paired cameras? If you understood the idea behind the De Bruyne graph approach, here's the hint. Consider a paired De Bruyne graph. We will now discuss some challenges that you will face while working with real sequencing data. In the past, we made some unrealistic assumption about our sequencing data. We assume the perfect coverage of genome by reads, which means every camera from the genome is represented by a read. For most of the problems that we looked at, we assume that reads are error-free. We also assume that multiplicity of camers in the genome are known, and we assume that distances between reads within read pairs are exact. In reality, we have imperfect coverage of genome by reads. Reads do not start at each position of the genome. In reality, reads are error-prone. Multiplicity of k-mers are unknown, and distances between reads within read pairs are inexact. And it makes the problem of genome assembly more difficult than the, uh, the problem we considered before. Let's consider the first unrealistic assumption that reads have perfect coverage, or in other words, they start at every position of a genome. In reality, they start at some position in the genome. For example, 250 nucleotide reads generated by Illumina, the leading sequencing company today, capture only a small fraction of 250 mers from the genome, thus violating the key assumption of the De Bruyne graphs. What should we do to generate a perfect coverage from uh, existing coverage, limited coverage by reads? There is a simple solution. Let's break reads into shorter cameras. And when we have done it for four reads on the left, uh, the result is perfect coverage by shorter five mers on the right. And thus, we can apply the De Bruyne graph idea to this set of, bro uh, of reads broken into cameras. Second unrealistic assumption in most problems in this capstone so far, we consider it error-free reads. Imagine what happens if we add to four error-free reads that we considered before the fifth read uh, that has one substitution error. And it will result after breaking these reads into five mers into many erroneous five mers generated from these reads. How will it affect our De Bruyne graph? If we would construct De Bruyne graph of this fragment from error free read reads, we would see a perfect path. But when we add erroneous five mers, there is additional alternative path added to this structure, and this path forms, erroneous path forms a so-called bubble with the correct path. And bubble detection problem is design an algorithm for finding bubbles in a directed graph. Output the number of bubbles in the De Bruyne graph constructed from the k mare occurring in thousand error-prone traits from a mutated phage genome. We define a bubble in this case as two 
short alternative passes between the same vertices in the De Bruyne graph, and it will be up to you to define parameters for selecting bubbles and looking at uh, data that we will provide to solve this bubble detection problem. And when you move to larger De Bruyne graph, for example, De Bruyne graph for bacterial green genome, you will see an explosion of bubbles. There will be a huge number of bubbles in the De Bruyne graph of real data sets. And your goal will be to find out, nevertheless, in this uh, ocean of bubble, correct edges in the De Bruyne graph. And this will result in the problem of reconstructing the phage genome from error-prone reads using De Bruyne graph. The third unrealistic assumption, we assume that multiplicity of k-mers in the De Bruyne graph are known. For example, here you have three, uh, three mers ATG connecting the same vertices in the De Bruyne graph. In reality, we often don't know multiplicity, so in the De Bruyne graph, instead of three edges, you may only see one. And uh, I want you to think about the problem of inferring multiplicity of k mers in the De Bruyne graph. And in fact, this problem can be formulated as one of the problems you have already studied in this specialization before. Which one? After you consider all these complications, you will be ready for solving the last rather challenging problem in this capstone, assembling E. coli X genome from real reads. And after you solve this problem, we have the most challenging problem in this course for you, assembling E. coli X genome from real read pairs. Good luck. It was a real pleasure working with you in this specialization.